Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the anatomy of the cervical spine, particularly looking at C-spine x-rays. Now there are three main views that we take when looking at the cervical spine. We're just going to start with our lateral view, move on to our frontal view, and then assess our open mouth view or our peg or dental view of the C-spine. Now before we get on to looking at the anatomy on an x-ray, I first actually want to look at a CT scan so we can gain a greater appreciation for what the 3D morphology of the cervical vertebra are. They are quite different to the thoracic and lumbar vertebra, and it's difficult when we look at an x-ray and try and appreciate which bits of the vertebra are where because everything is superimposed on top of one another. So let's head over to a CT scan and then go to our x-rays. So here we have an axial bone windowed CT. We can head up into the skull base first. Now, this is an image you should be familiar with. If you've watched the skull base foramina videos, you should be comfortable naming these various foramina that are passing through. And as we head down towards our occipital bone, we should find our occipital condyles that articulate with our atlas, our C1. So here is the anterior body of our C1, the anterior arch. And as we head down inferiorly a little bit more, our posterior arch here of C1. Now C1 is called the atlas, like the Greek god, the atlas holding the globe up. And that's exactly what it does. It sits at the base of the skull and articulates with that occipital bone around the foramen magnum region there. You can see our anterior arch here, find our lateral bodies. We've got transverse foramina that allow for our vertebral arteries to go up into the base of the brain. And we can see these transverse processes out the side. The C1 transverse processes are actually quite large in comparison to some of the other cervical vertebra. And then we have this posterior arch with a posterior body here, and sometimes a very small or rudimentary spinous process. You can see our anterior arch is surrounding this structure here, which is our dense or our odontoid process of C2 sitting below it. You can see that our C1 or our atlas doesn't actually have a vertebral body and this is kind of a remnant of that vertebral body here with C2 contributing this dense process allowing us for rotation and flexion and movement at that point here. There's a ligament that comes across here, our transverse ligament that holds this dense in place and we've got an articular surface here that allows for articulation between the anterior body of our C1 and our dense process. So let's move down. We're going to see the dense fan out into the body of C2, our axis, sitting below our atlas. And we can see as we head further down C2, we get this posterior arch, and this is our spinal canal. So we can see that C2 has a small vertebral body, it's still got transverse foramina, allowing for the vertebral arteries to flow up. Then it's got our lamina, heading backwards to the spinous process, also a very small spinous process on C2. Now C1 and C2, our atlas and our axis, have quite different morphology to the rest of the vertebra. So let's pick a random vertebra here. We can see here that we have our vertebral body, our transverse foramina, allowing for those vertebral arteries to come up towards from the subclavian arteries all the way up to the brain before they fuse to form the basilar artery. Away from our vertebral bodies, we have what's known as the pedicle. The pedicle then heads out, and in our cervical spine, our transverse processes here, it's kind of a bifid transverse process, it's actually kind of anterior to our pedicles, and you'll see that changes as we head down into the thoracic vertebra. Our lamina posteriorly fuse to form our spinous process, and one of the distinctive features of our cervical spine is that we have these bifid spinous processes, especially in the superior region of the cervical spine. We then have a mass of uh, bone here that we call our pars interarticularis that actually is the region between our inferior and superior processes that allow for those facet joints to form. We can see a facet joint here. So our pedicles, our pars interarticularis, and our lamina heading out towards our spinous process with our vertebral body at the front and our transverse processes in our cervical spine quite anterior. So let's head all the way down into the thoracic spine so we can see some of those differences. Here we know this is a thoracic spine because now we've got ribs articulating with these transverse processes. You can see an anterior vertebral body, and as we head further and further inferior in the spine, that vertebral body gets bigger and bigger. It needs to allow for more and more weight bearing as we head further down. 
We've now got large, well-defined pedicles that we didn't really see as well in our cervical spine. And you can see our transverse processes are now posterior to that pedicle there. And then we have our lamina, smaller, more angulated lamina, heading out towards our spinous process, which is much larger as we head further down in the spine. And it's not bifid here, as you can see. So let's now go to our x-rays and identify these various structures on the three different views. So let's start by looking at our lateral x-ray, and we can get probably the most information from our lateral, so it's a good place to start. The first thing I like to do when looking at the cervical spine on an x-ray is make sure we've got correct alignment. Malalignment of the spine is a great indicator for something else happening that's wrong. If we see malalignment, we need to find the pathology. So before we can ascertain whether this cervical spine is indeed well aligned, we first need to check that we have the correct angle on our lateral here, that the x-ray itself is not rotated. And the best way to do that when looking at a lateral cervical spine x-ray is to find the angle of the mandible here. We can see on this posterior surface of the mandible, the left and right mandibles line up well. If we were rotated at all, there'd be malalignment of those posterior surfaces. So we know that this patient is square on to our x-ray. And we can check for lateral tilt of the head or neck by looking at the inferior surface here. And we want to see that they're generally well aligned. And here we can see the two inferior surfaces. There's not much difference between those. We've caught it on the right angle. And actually on a true lateral, there will be a slight difference due to the fanning out of those x-rays as we head towards the scanner. So now that we know the x-ray is well aligned, let's see if the cervical spine itself is well aligned. Now the first line that we look at is called the anterior vertebral line. Now all of these lines that we look at, we want a slight lordosis to these lines. We don't want them to be dead straight or any kyphosis in the cervical spine. So you can see here, if we follow the anterior surfaces of those vertebral bodies, we have a nice smooth lordotic line. Then we can head posteriorly and we want to do the same here. Look at the posterior line along those vertebral bodies. We've got a nice smooth lordotic view here. This line represents the posterior longitudinal ligament and the anterior line is the anterior longitudinal ligament. The next line we look at is what's known as our spinolaminar line. So we can see our spinous processes here. They're a little bit less dense than our lamina that head out sharply from our pars into articularis heading towards that spinous process making the posterior arch of that spinal canal so here is our spinolaminar line there heading across again it's smooth it's lordotic it's slightly more lordotic than our anterior and posterior lines and the last line we look at is our posterior spinous line we take the tips of these spinous processes and join them up. And what we're looking for here is that there's a nice smooth line. It's quite lordotic normally when joining these spinous processes, and we don't want any major step off between one vertebra and the other. And here we don't really include our C1 spinous process if it does have a spinous process. We start from C2 and draw that line. So we've got our anterior vertebral line, posterior vertebral line, our spinolaminar line, which also correlates to where our ligamentum flavum is. And this is the posterior border of our spinal canal. So our spinal canal lies here between our posterior vertebral line and our spinolaminar line. And then we have our posterior spinal line. So now that we know it's well aligned, let's have a look at some of the anatomy of the cervical spine. We'll start at C1, our atlas. You can see our anterior body here forming almost this oval shape with a flat posterior surface. That articulates with the anterior surface of our dense. If we follow the outline of the dense here, it protrudes into that C1 vertebra. The space between our anterior surface of the odontoid and our posterior articular surface of this anterior body of C1 should be less than 3 millimeters in adults and less than 5 millimeters in children. So that gap gets slightly smaller as we go through puberty. We can then look at our posterior body of our C1 atlas, as well as the small spinous process here. Moving down to C2, we can see our vertebral body, as well as our dense heading forward, and then our lamina heading posteriorly towards our spinous process. If you look at the shape of these vertebral bodies of our C3 to C6, you can see the superior end plate of the vertebral body is quite flat, and our inferior surface has this curved appearance with this protrusion anteriorly and this is normal morphology for our cervical spine and that gets flatter and flatter as we head out towards our thoracic spine. 
The spaces between our vertebral bodies are where our intervertebral discs lie. We can't see the discs on an x-ray, but we can appreciate the space that they create. You can see on the superior corner of these vertebral bodies, we have more dense regions than the rest of the vertebral body. And this is our pedicle heading out towards us, as well as our transverse process coming out here. And our transverse process has that transverse foramina that allows the vertebral arteries to head up through the cervical spine, protected by those bones, because it's a very vulnerable region on the body, and then heading up through our foramen magnum, eventually becoming our basilar artery. Here we can see the joint facets. Let me just go and draw these. We can see the facet joint here between our two cervical vertebrae. This is between C2 and C4. Our C2 to C3 facet joint is a bit more difficult to see because of the angle of that facet joint. It's a bit more facing medially than the rest. We can look at these facet joints, and in between the facet joint, this part of bone here is called our pars interarticularis. From there, heading out towards our spinous process, that region there is called our lamina, and then there, our spinous process heading out. So our pedicle, giving rise to our transverse process, then heading out towards our pars interarticularis, our lamina, and our spinous process. Now there are a couple of other things apart from the cervical bones that we can look at here. We've mentioned the mandible coming in here. If we head to the very top of our image, we're almost cutting it off here, but here is our cella tersica. Now cella tersica then heads down a bone known as our clivus. And our clivus should then be pointing towards the tip of our odontoid process. In front of that cella tersica are our sphenoid sinuses, as you would recall from our sphenoid sinus talk. And then we have some soft tissue that is anterior to our cervical spine here. And it's really important to note the thickness of these soft tissues. We can see our nasal cavity here, then heading to our oral cavity, which ends at the level of our hyoid bone. You can just see our hyoid bone there, so our nasopharynx, our oropharynx. Below that is our laryngopharynx. And then you can see the laryngeal cartilages here, our larynx and our trachea heading off towards the mediastinum. So from C1 to C4, let's count it out. One, two, three, four. This region above here, this soft tissue is known as our retropharyngeal soft tissue. Below that is called our retrotracheal soft tissue. Now one of the questions that you can get asked that can kind of catch you out is how many cervical vertebrae there are. And if you know this well, it might seem silly to you, but people get confused because we have eight cervical nerve roots, but only seven cervical vertebra. And that's important to know that we should be able to see the whole of this seventh cervical vertebra in order to adequately assess the cervical spine on a lateral x-ray. And hopefully we'll see a bit of T1 coming in as well. Now, why are there seven cervical vertebra and eight cervical nerve roots? Well, the first nerve root comes in above C1. So the nerve roots are named according to the vertebra that they come out above. And then we will have C7 coming out above C7. And then the space between C7 and T1, that nerve root is called C8. From the thoracic vertebra down, our nerve roots that are associated with the corresponding vertebral body then come out below the vertebral body. That's another difference of the cervical spine as opposed to the thoracic and lumbar spines. Now it's quite difficult to appreciate on this view the pedicle coming out straight towards us because we're foreshortening that pedicle. We've got superimposition of this transverse process and this pars interarticularis. It's quite difficult to appreciate. And we know that the nerve roots come out between those pedicles. And if we want to see that space where the nerve root is coming out, what we can do is get an oblique view, as you can see like this. We've taken a lateral view and tilted the patient slightly. You can see now our vertebral body here and our pedicle coming off of that vertebral body. Here are our facet joints. We move those facet joints out laterally like that and allowed for those pedicles to now come into our plane. And here we can see the pedicles make the superior and the inferior borders of this intervertebral foramen, which is where our nerve roots come out. And it's important to note that our transverse processes are coming out anteriorly from these pedicles as we looked at on our CT scan. They lie quite anterior to those pedicles.
And above those, we get what's known as an uncinate process, a portion of bone that heads superiorly from that vertebral body that can then impinge on this space. And we can see our uncinate process better on our frontal view. So let's have a look at our frontal view. And while we're on the topic of the uncinate process, you can see here this process heading up superiorly. This there is our uncinate process. And growth of those processes can impinge on those nerve roots coming out between the pedicles. Now, before we can review any of the anatomy, let's make sure we've got the correct alignment. One of the easiest ways to know that you've got the correct alignment is to look at the trachea here and see your spinous processes posteriorly. And you want your trachea and your spinous processes to be aligned. Spinous processes are really superior, trachea is anterior. Any rotation, we're going to get malalignment of those two. We can also look at the trachea and our proximal portions of our clavicles here and make sure the distance between those and the trachea is generally quite straight. Our trachea can head off a little bit more to the right, so sometimes it's better to look at the spinous process itself between those clavicles. So let's have a look at some of the anatomy on the frontal view. On this view, we can actually see our C2 body heading up towards our odontoid process or our dance and heading across like that. There's our lateral bodies of our atlas, our C1, and then we'd be able to count the cervical vertebra down. We can see the bodies of our cervical vertebra here. These are the typical shape of those vertebral bodies. Our pedicles will be heading out. We can just see our transverse processes coming out like that. And that's what makes these small bumps along the side of our cervical spine frontal x-ray. Sometimes we have a cervical rib coming out here, and it can be very easy to call this vertebra here T1, especially if we have that cervical rib. And the best way to know that this is in fact C7 is C7 has these large transverse processes that angle downwards, angle inferiorly. And T1's transverse processes actually angle superiorly like that. So we get this angle here, this diamond shape, that is the joint between C7 and T1. There we can see our first rib coming off of T1. Some other anatomy to note is to look at our spinous processes. You can see here as we head superiorly, we have these bifid spinous processes like that. And then they become unified. We get single spinous processes as we head down towards the thoracic vertebra. We can see our facet joints here. We're not going to be looking through the joint itself because those joints are lying at an angle to our frontal view. But we can appreciate those joints here and here, and here, and this region here, this region of bone is our pars interarticularis. And what we get is an interarticular column being formed here, as well as our vertebral column being formed there. We can look at the trachea itself, and as we head up towards the larynx, that trachea narrows, and we get our piriform recesses here as well of our trachea, as then we head up into the oropharynx. Here is our trachea heading down. This lucency can confuse you. The bone is not loosened. It's the trachea overlying the bone. These vertebral bodies are in fact normal. Let's move on to our last view, and this is our peg view or our open mouth view. We first check that it's technically sound. We can see our teeth line up with this occipital bone across there. Then we know we've got a good view into our C1, which is here, which wraps around. You can see these wrapping around the odontoid process. We want to see that the space between our dense or our odontoid process is the same on both sides between these lateral bodies of our C1. And again, we want to see that the lateral bodies of C1 match up to the lateral bodies here of C2. You can see our C2 spinous process here is also bifid along that side. And here is our C2 vertebral body that extends upwards into our dense. And really, this open mouth view is to establish the relationship between our C1 and C2 and make sure that there's no fractures between any of those bones. So we've looked at our lateral view, our frontal view, as well as our open mouth view. And the most important thing when assessing a cervical spine x-ray is checking that you've got good alignment of the bones and then specifically looking at each portion of those vertebrae. Because the anatomy is all overlying one another, we need to systematically go through the regions, look at the vertebral body, look at the pedicle, then look at our transverse processes, then look at our pars interarticularis as well as our facet joints, then look at our lamina heading back towards our spinous processes. If we can go through the cervical spine x-ray systematically like that, we're much less likely to miss anything. And if you remember one thing, 
is look at the surrounding soft tissue. That can often be the clue that something sinister is happening within the bones of the cervical spine. So thank you very much for watching today's video. I'm really appreciating all the comments and the messages that I've been getting saying I must continue this series. So that's what we're gonna do. I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.